Okay, so now that the recording has started, what I will do after we just finished a prayer is address the theme for this talk. And the theme is the cause for the pause. <laughs> and it stands on its own merit, rides on its own merit. It's a pause, it's not a condemnation. And some people call it a suspension. A, a pause. Suspend or pause is the same thing. It doesn't mean it's over. It means it's temporarily on hold. And there's reason for that. Okay. Um, and that's what I'm going to go into. Is Louise's cause for beatification paused or suspended or on hold? It appears so, but we can't say for certain. Back, uh, back in April of last year, there was allegedly a document issued by the Dicastery for the Causes of Saints by the Secret uh, Prefect Marcello. And uh, in it, there were reasons addressed in French for Louisa's cause being put on pause. Now, why do I say we can't say for certain? Because this document is confidential. It's not for the public. However, in recent days, a, a magazine, a French magazine posted this document that they claim is authentic. It has a protocol number. It has the, car, uh, the Cardinal signature, Marcello signature, and it's addressed in French to a priest named uh, Bishop Benoit. So I looked at that letter that was posted, but, and on the top of it, it says confidential, <laughs> which means that this company who's posting it is violating civil laws, and they seem to be proud about doing that. This is not the way that God, I don't think, would expect us to address people when the church we serve tells us that certain things should be confidential. Why? Number one, a civil infraction can bring with it not only penalties of fines, but also um, punishment, ecclesial punishment. But again, we're living in times where people do their own thing in the name of the church as well, you know? And these are sad times because there's a lot of confusion, a lot of disunity, disharmony. But the question is now, is this document authentic? Now, because it's confidential and I'm in no position, unless I directly talk to the Cardinal to confirm this, um, to say it is, because if I did so, I would not only be encouraging these people from breaking the seal of confidentiality, but I would be doing the same by talking about it with you. So how do I address this matter then, which is a very thorny issue? You see the position I'm in? This is how I address it. Assuming that this document is valid. I have already addressed the points this document brings up. I have not yet submitted my addressed objections to the two dicasteries I am supposed to do, uh, I'm supposed to address and do so in writing. I'm going to do that, okay? Now, why did I already address this if I didn't know about this document? Well, I didn't read the document because it was confidential until a few, uh, a little while ago. But I did know of the issues already. These were public back in Archbishop Carmelo Casati's time. This is back in the, in the 90s before Picchieri came in. Casati had submitted to two theologians at the Pontifical University in Rome. One I personally knew. So what were the issues? Well, the issues are basically what is stated in that allegedly leaked document from April 18th, 9, 2022. They're pretty consistent. So it seems to me that that document does look accurate. I'm going to quote to you from a document from the Magisterium 
that was put out by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger before he became Pope Benedict XVI, while he was prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith before it changed his name to Dicastery. Now before, by the way, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith existed, it was called the Holy Congregation. And then it became, the, it was called the, called the Holy, Holy Office. Then it became the Congregation. Then it became the Dicastery. So it changes its names. This is what came out from the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. It was, it's, the title of the document is Donum Veritatis. Donum is a gift. Veritatis is the truth. All right, then it adds, the theologian has the duty to make known to the magisterial authorities the problems raised by the teaching itself in the arguments proposed to justify it. So I have my arguments prepared to justify my objection. Or even in the manner in which it is presented. This is what I said, suppose it's presented but ambiguously or incorrectly or incompletely. It's my duty to say, look, you missed something. He should do this in a evangelical spirit and with a profound desire to resolve the difficulties. So I have a profound desire to resolve the difficulties. And I prepared a draft of my objections. And I will go into the church teaching me, teaching the theologian, that he has a duty to present his objections to the authorities. And that's what I'm going to do in the next few days. So keep me in prayer that I present it in the right way. Because wording has everything to do with theology. And it continues the statement of Article 39 of Donum Veritatis. The theologian's objections could then contribute to real progress. The theologian's objections, see? So a theologian has to have objections, and I do. They contribute to real progress and can provide a stimulus to the magisterium to propose the teaching of the church in greater depth and with a clearer presentation of the arguments. Okay, now that's one of the statements uh, on, the, on the vocation of the theologian. There is another document uh, that came out in 1975. The document I just shared with you, Donum Veritatis, came out in 1990. The one I'm quoting to you from now was called the International Theological Commission, the Ecclesiastical Magisterium and Theology. It came out in 1975. And it states here that the theologian's duty is to investigate and explain the doctrine of faith and to preserve the sacred deposit of faith of revelation and to examine it more deeply and explain the truth, to defend it for the service and the people of God for the world's salvation. So I'm therefore going to, having qualified what I'm going to say, I have to take this seriously. I'm not going to try to exert public media pressure because that's not what the theologian should do. I wish to emphasize that I'm not trying to turn to the mass media, but to have recourse to the responsible authorities. For it is not in seeking to exert public pressure or opinion that one contributes to the clarification of doctrinal issues, it's not. And therefore, what I share with you now is not in any way to be taken as me trying to pub exert public pressure upon them through using the meat against them. No, that's not what I'm doing. All right, now that I've introduced it with that qualification, what are the issues? Okay, now um, I will go into that. First, as many of you know, I'm a theologian authorized by the Holy See, the Catholic Church, because I defended a doctoral dissertation before the faculties of dogmatic and spiritual theology, the professors of those universities authorized by the Holy See, and these are pontifical universities in Rome, okay? These two faculties of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome uh, approved with the seals of official approval my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation on the entire corpus of Luisa Picaretta's writings. Now, how did they do that? How did I do that? We both did it by me spending over 10 years translating her writings from the original manuscripts in Italian to English. Now, I condensed all of these writings into 
just about 400 pages that in my doctoral dissertation, which is about 700 pages. So 400 of those 700 pages is all Louisa's writings that I quote and explain. And I compare her writings with 2000 years of Eastern and Western doctrine and theology. So I'm in a position to challenge the authorities who put out this statement or who have expressed reason for the cause to pause because this is my bread and butter. <laughs> and not only did I submit this, but the professors approved it. And this doctoral dissertation on all of Louisa's writings has the seals of approval of the Pontifical University that's authorized by the Holy See. So I will remind them of this when I submit my objections and let them know why I'm doing it, because this, of course, is my vocation and my duty. Now, what I want to emphasize is that it's a Faustina Kowalska or, or um, Margaret Mary Alacock or Bridget of Sweden or Catherine of Siena or Luisa Picaretta or others um, have little to no understanding due to no fault of their own, they're just not conversant in this field, of the context of the author's culture, language, and milieu environment. In entrusting the theologian with extrapolating the meaning of the prophetic text, the most biblical prophetic text, for example, Louisa's writings, he must, um, in entrusting them with this, he's given an injunction to acknowledge the inspired writer as the living and reasonable instrument of the Holy Spirit, who uses, uh, whom, whose faculties God uses to better understand who was the, who the author, inspired author was and what the meaning of the author was. So the theologian's duty is to try to understand what the intended meaning of the author was when they wrote. You can't just limit yourself to what is written. And this is why I say most people are not familiar with this. Why? Because number one, you cannot understand the author's intended meaning unless you know their original language, culture, and milieu. Take for example, Jesus Christ. He spoke in a way that can only be understood in his context, in Hebrew, in which there were no superlatives, you know? In the Old Testament, for example, before Christ, there were expressions in Hebrew as well, like the earth has pillars, the sky is a dome. We know that's false, but it's not supposed to be meant just by reading it literally. You have to understand what, why would you use those words? Because in Hebrew, there are no superlatives. Like for example, when Caleb was sent to reconnoiter the land by Moses, he came back saying they were, we, they were as tall as trees and we were as small as grasshoppers. They used those words because there was no tall list and small list, there were no superlatives in Hebrew. So they had to fill in that lack of superlative with examples, like as big as and as small as, or it's as strong as, the earth is so strong it's like on pillars, right? Same with Louisa's writings, same with Jesus Christ. Jesus said things in the, old, in the New Testament that you can only understand. He is the author, or not the author, but the source of the New Testament. Only if you knew the Greek, the Aramaic. He spoke Aramaic, but it was written in Greek. You can only read the Bible if understand it properly if you know the Koine Greek. The English translation does not allow you to fully understand the, Koine, the original expressions. I'll give you an example. When Jesus went, appeared, after the resurrection on the shore in John's gospel, I think it's chapter 21. He told Simon Peter, oh yes, Simon Peter, do you love me three times? Now, how do you understand that in English? If you read the English Bible, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? In Greek, it's not like that. There are th two different types of love mentioned in those three sentences. One's agape and one's philae. So one is, do you love me with a divine love? And the other is, do you love me with a human love? You don't get that in English. It's just, do you love me, do you love me? Same thing with Louisa's writings. If you don't know the Italian, you're gonna miss out on half of the theology. When you find, when a theologian, 
who is entrusted with the task of reviewing writings before they're published finds these discrepancies, he should either remove them or not even print them, knowing that they were unintentional. But if he knows they were intentional, then he must declare that work not inspired by God. Unfortunately, today, we have a situation where it's a blessing and a curse. The volumes are all circulated in different languages, but they're not the original manuscript. And this causes problems because people are reading them and interpreting them not in the right way. Now, this is cause for them to turn to the church's theologians for enlightenment. This is how it works. Now, you may not find many theologians who are familiar with these writings, so you turn to those who are familiar with theology, like the priests. They're the ones that are, Jesus says, they have the keys of knowledge. They're the ones who are supposed to help you understand these passages. Pride is one of the most harmful things to Louise's cause, human pride and ignorance. And I'm not saying these people are bad. Some of times the pride is overzealousness. Like Peter, when he sheathed his sword out of the scabbard to cut off Malachi's ear to stop Jesus from being arrested, Jesus said, in the hours of the Passion, this was excessive zeal. Excessive zeal, it's not good. Sometimes people want to get Louisa out, but they don't go to the proper authorities. They anticipate printing the reading, the writings, and they start interpreting them on their own, like we don't need the priest. Like, well, by the time the priest coming around, we'll be dead. We might as well read it on our own and interpret it on our own. There are priests always out there. Just ask them, be humble, learn how to do it. Well, I'm just saying this for your own sake. I'm not going to make you do anything you don't want to do. It's about you do what you want. But the right way is the way Christ put in motion. And um, when I say it's not just pride, it's ignorance and it's not their fault, what I mean is if someone has not read all the writings and they're giving a judgment, and that judgment is going to be impaired because they haven't read everything. Back in 1997, the year in which I was ordained, after I was ordained, Father Antonio Resta, who was the rector of the Pontifical University Theological Institute in Southern Italy, read all Louise's writings when he was asked to by Archbishop Cassati and submitted his report to the tribunal of the Archdiocese of Trani in John June 2nd, 1997. He, along with Father Cosimo Rejo, who was the professor of dogmatic theology, two theologians, also submitted his report to the tribunal, both of whom stated independently without communicating with each other to commission theologians that Louise's writings contain nothing contrary to faith and morals. I invite everybody to come together, put your divisions aside, put your little crowns on the ground for a few minutes and uh, Get on your knees and pray to God and the Blessed Mother that this cause be revitalized. Maybe, I see the finger of God in this, just maybe this is happening for good reason. There was a lot of bickering in the last 20 years between groups in the divine will, and this is no secret. And there was a lot of division. Maybe God doesn't want Louisa to be beatified until we show him that we're humble enough for it to happen. 